welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're super excited to have this presentation on school-based audiology assessments and interventions after epilepsy surgery. And we're really lucky to have two fabulous presenters with us tonight. Um, Amanda Levy is a clinical and educational audiologist um, who's worked both in the school setting and in private practice. And I'm gonna let her do a little more of an introduction if she wants to do that when, um, when she starts. And then Daphne Magdaleno is the parent to a now, I believe nine-year-old, 11. 11-year-old <laughs> um, boy who had a uh, hemispherectomy. And um, I just reached out to both of them to walk you all through their journey with uh, figuring out appropriate acoustic environment um, for Daphne's son after his surgery, um, which um, Amanda played a fa fabulous role with. And I'm gonna let them explain what's going on, um, what happened, and we'll take it from there. So Daphne, why don't you start by introducing yourself and kind of your perspective on, on where things, how things happened. Yeah, so uh, as Audrey said, my name is Daphne Magdaleno. Uh, my son is 11 years old. He had his functional hemispherectomy in uh, December of 2016. And then he had a, um, a revision surgery um, about a year later. Um, we've been seizure free since then, knock, knock wood. Um, but when Jacob returned to campus, um, it was in the midst of um, a complete overhaul, a complete remodel. So half the campus was essentially a, a construction zone and Jacob's classroom was kind of situated on right on the outskirts of that. Um, and, you know, prior prior to this, we had understood that there would be some um, auditory processing deficits as a result of his surgery. His um, temporal lobe was removed and the corpus callosum was disconnected in his surgery. So we were um, anticipating some level of auditory processing disorder to what extent we didn't know. Um, but we did notice that he was extremely sensitive to um, a lot of noises happening at once. And that was even early, um, evident early on in his recovery in the hospital. If, for example, um, he was listening to something on his iPad and the doctors came in to round or the nurses came in to speak to me, having those two things going on at once was very, very overwhelming for him. He would you know, immediately become very agitated. Um, returning home, he has two little sisters, he had a dog, it's a very loud house. Um, we would find the same thing when there were a lot of things going on at once in the same room, it was very overwhelming for him. So, um, you know, anecdotally experiencing that and then knowing what we should expect uh, based on the information that was available to us at the time from Brain Recovery Project. Um, we went to the school district and requested that they perform, you know, some functional auditory assessment um, to really get an understanding of how exactly the noise in the classroom was impacting him and his learning and his behavior, because we were seeing a lot of these behaviors um, occur at school that were either out of the ordinary for him or seem to kind of be, um, related to some of the more intense work he was doing that would require a high, higher level of concentration. So knowing that the classroom was loud, um, we brought it to our IEP team and that's kind of where Amanda enters the story. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, so that, what a perfect uh, segue. So, yep, that's where I came in. I was working as the educational audiologist for uh, Jacob's school district. And um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today is assessments that can determine functional listening, uh, especially in this case, when, when we know after hemispherectomy or other brain surgery, we're going to have some kind of auditory processing deficit. Um, can I just I, make a clarification here for us yes. that are listening? So any surgery that impacts the temporal lobe or the corpus callosum 
has the potential to uh, result in a cortical auditory processing disorder or central auditory processing disorder. So we're tonight we're not discussing that. We're not discussing how that's diagnosed or treated. We're discussing what happens in the school setting in terms of assessments that can be done by a school-based audiologist and the acoustical measures. And Thanks. we sent you some uh, resources and you can always reach out to me uh, directly with more questions. Take it away. Thank you. That's exactly what I was about to clarify. So uh, that topic you just mentioned is like a whole, uh, you know, graduate level semester at least of education. So we're going to assume we already know all about auditory processing disorder and cortical auditory impairment after uh, brain surgery uh, and jump right into functional listening. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Awesome. <laughs> Love it when it works. Okay, so uh, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Um, why am I here? Why am I talking to you? I'm a clinical and educational audiologist. Um, in the top right, you can see me being an educational audiologist lugging one, two, three, four um, sound field amplification systems uh, out of a classroom on the last day of school. And on below that, you can see me being a clinical audiologist in um, April of 2020 <laughs> when uh, COVID became a thing. Um, I own a private practice specializing in auditory processing disorder. I am the mom of a 16 month old and two noisy dogs who you will probably hear at some point. So I wanted you to be able to see all three of them because um, you know they'll probably make themselves heard. Uh, and I am passionate about helping people here. Um, it's what I've been doing as an audiologist for mm, almost 10 years and uh, what I'm hoping to do even more of uh, with my private practice. So we're going to be talking about uh, four topics today. And there are some questions I have below each topic here. I want you to be able to answer these questions. And I hope that by listening to all of this, these are the questions you'll be able to answer at the end of our chat today. So classroom acoustics, how can a quiet classroom actually be too noisy? Listening challenges, so what listening challenges can occur due to classroom acoustics being poor? How can we measure a student's auditory access in the classroom? And how can we help students hear and understand better in the classroom? So hopefully these are questions that are relevant to you and your kiddo in school. And I want you to be able to take this information um, and apply it in your own child's life. So let's talk a little bit about acoustics. Acoustics 101. Um, I just want you to take a moment and review this um, very scientific diagram here. So you can see the sound of a musician on stage bounces off the auditorium walls to surround the audience. And the sound from the pigeon on the stage does not do this because the reason is acoustics. Okay, yeah, it's a joke. Uh, <laughs> it looks very technical, but totally a joke. This is like my favorite joke and I show it to everyone, basically any chance I get, so thank you. All right, so let me just clarify two terms here. Acoustics is the study of the physical properties of sound and psychoacoustics is how we perceive sound. So when we're talking about a child's access to information, auditory in the classroom, we're talking about both acoustics and psychoacoustics. There are three main factors that can make it hard to hear in a classroom. The first one is distance. How far away is the speaker from the listener? Is the teacher moving around the room? Does the student have a flexible seat where they can be close to the source of the action? The second is noise, ambient noise, uh, meaning the air conditioner running, the water fountain cooler humming, um, and also classroom noise, chairs being pushed back, other students speaking, pencils clicking, pencil sharpener going. And the third is reverberation or echo. And the longer it takes an echo to bounce off the wall and reach the listener's ears, the more blurred the sound gets. So these are the three factors that we want to address to make it easier to hear in a classroom. 
the acoustics of the classroom are influenced by the size of the room. A very large classroom is going to have more of an echo. It's going to have the potential for greater distance from the listener. The materials used in the classroom make a difference. So if there is a tile floor and hard walls and a high ceiling, we're gonna get a lot of echo, a lot of reverberation. Whereas if we have carpeting, if we have uh, materials on the walls, whether they're acoustic panels, fabric, uh, whether there's furniture that's soft to absorb some of that sound is gonna be helpful. And also what's outside? Is there a huge construction project going on a hundred feet from the child's classroom as uh, we had in the case that Daphne was describing. Uh, and classroom acoustic environments are dynamic. They change throughout the day, depending on the activity the students are doing, the time of day, the type of learning, whether it's a small group activity or a whole class activity, and also classroom management. The teacher plays a big role in the noise level of the classroom. I want to play you some samples. Ooh, you know what? I'm going to stop sharing and reshare because I'm going to share my audio with you. There we go. Um, I'm going to play some audio for you of what different challenges in the classroom can sound like. So first, I'm going to play you this clip here um, that is uh, just a, a phrase. A carrot is a long reddish yellow vegetable which has several thin leaves on a long stem and which belongs to the parsley family. Did you hear that? Okay, so it's about a carrot. We learned some new information. We got a new vocabulary word, carrot. We heard that it's a vegetable. We heard that it has leaves on a stem. And what family does it belong to? Did you get that? You can type it in the chat. Anybody? What family does it belong to? Parsley. All right. They're very good. The parsley family. So you just learned some new information in an ideal listening environment. It was nice and quiet. So let's add some noise to that environment and see what that sounds like. A carrot is a long reddish yellow vegetable which has several thin leaves on a long stem and which belongs to the parsley family. So that was typical classroom noise. Uh, I think that recording actually was taken in a cafeteria. So, you know, typical school noise. Um, it made it a lot harder to hear. And now let's add in, um, so let's take the noise away, pretend the classroom's really quiet, but it's a really large, really reverberant classroom. This is what that same message will sound like. A carrot is a long reddish yellow vegetable which has several thin leaves on a long stem and which belongs to the parsley family. So, you know, maybe uh, it's a bit of a cave or an auditorium, but that reverberation smears the spectral characteristics of the sound, making it harder to interpret. Now let's talk about distance. What if the teacher is really far away from the student? We're gonna lose the high frequency sounds of that information. And in terms of speech, the high frequency sounds are most of the consonants, like the S and the T and the CH and the SH. So this is what it will sound like if we lose some of our high frequency consonants. A carrot is a long reddish yellow vegetable which has several thin leaves on a long stem and which belongs to the parsley family. We can still hear it, but it's a little muffled, a little blurry. And now let's hear what happens if we have the trifecta, distance, noise, and reverberation. A carrot is a long reddish yellow vegetable which has several thin leaves on a long stem and which belongs to the parsley family. So, when we have all three combined, it gets really hard to hear what's going on. Maybe if you if you know the stories about a carrot, if you know it's part of the parsley family, uh, you can you can pull those details out. But a lot of detail is going to get lost, especially for new information and new vocabulary. So. First, I want to talk about noise. Um, noise can be really sneaky. Even if a teacher has really great control of the classroom listening environment, 
air conditioning systems can be really old and they can be malfunctioning. They can actually be way too loud in a classroom. Or, you know, I'm in Southern California, so I don't think any schools in a hundred miles of me have a furnace, but I know depending on where you are, furnace, furnace systems make a lot of noise in the classroom too. Um, a noisy classroom next door can be a big deal as well. I know there are a lot of classrooms that are double and they have like a dividing wall between them that you can pull in and out. And that noise is not going to be blocked uh, effectively by a curtain like that unless you get a really good one. Um, kids on the playground while your class is in session is another sneaky source of noise. Um, Daphne's son's classroom was situated right next to the playground right next to, I believe the uh, tether ball was like right down from his classroom with the construction. It was like classroom, tether ball, construction. So it, it was really uh, intense. Um, construction noise adjacent to campus, pens clicking, pages turning, chairs squeaking, excess reverberation are all sources of noise. You can see in this picture of the classroom, there are all these um, tennis balls on the bottoms of the chairs. This is a great way to dampen some of the noise in a classroom, but you don't want to use real tennis balls. Like in this picture, um, apparently they release some kind of mildly toxic gas when you open up a tennis ball. So uh, they make chair caps that you can put on the bottom of chairs. Um, they're not that expensive. They work really well and they last from year to year. And up here at the top, I have this app called Too Noisy. This is an amazing app for classroom noise management. Um, it's free. The teacher puts it on and sticks their iPad up at the front of the classroom on the um, like whiteboard shelf or on their desk where all the students can see it. And when it's nice and calm in the classroom, the happy face is smiling, the sun is shining. And then, you know, if it gets a little too loud, the meter starts getting into the yellow and it gets cloudy and the happy face gets a little worried. And if it gets really loud, it's in the red, it's pouring rain, there's thunder, there's lightning, the happy face is in agony. And it's a, a nice visual way to get the class to monitor their own noise level. So if you have a noisy classroom for your kid, I highly recommend uh, having their teacher check out this app. So all of these challenges that we've been talking about, distance, noise, reverberation, happen before the sound even reaches our brain. So we haven't even started talking about psychoacoustics yet or about processing the sound that we've heard. We're just talking about getting the sound to our ears. Our ears are the doorway into our brain. So we wanna make sure that our kiddos are getting the most clear, unimpeded access to sound in the classroom. Because when we hear a clear signal, if we have auditory processing challenges or not, we're more likely to understand the signal if it's clear versus if it's distorted. So let's talk about how we determine what a student is hearing in the classroom. Listening assessment. There are a few tools that an educational audiologist will use. Observation, especially if it can be done in a few settings, is a really powerful tool. Um, we all know that kiddos can um, look like they're hearing really well or listening really well, and, and, and they're not. <laughs> um, I, I'm already seeing it with my 16 month old. So observation isn't the be all end all, but it's a really good clue into determining some challenges that might exist in the acoustic environment of the classroom and observing a child's behavior in response to different acoustic challenges. Um, so if you know the child can be an, observed in the situations that are really hard for them and really easy for them, we can determine some of the differences between them. There are also standardized rating scales. We'll talk about a few for the teacher to fill out, for the student to complete, assessing uh, subjectively listening ability. There's acoustic testing. So the audiologist can bring some equipment into the classroom, which I'll show you and determine the reverberation time, the background level of noise, um, a few different factors. And then my favorite is called a functional listening evaluation. This is a test that the audiologist can do with the student in their classroom to simulate what challenges, how challenges to the acoustic environment impact their listening. 
Um, so we want to look at uh, how the student during the observation, how the student responds to instructions, how they respond to multi-step directions, where are they seated, how are the desks arranged, how close are they to the instructor, um, is the teacher checking for understanding, what sources of noise are in the classroom. I always bring a sound level meter app on my, I have one on my phone, um, just to check the noise level at a few different places in the classroom and see um, how quiet or how noisy it gets. And these are two rating scales that I use quite often with my students. Um, they're called the LIFE R, it stands for Listening Inventory for Education. Um, so there's one for the teacher to fill out and one for the student to fill out. And the, the student one is really insightful because you can get a you can get a lot of detailed information about how the student perceives their own listening ability. Um, and I like to get a couple different teachers to fill it out if possible. Uh, that way I can compare in different environments how the student, uh, how the teacher is rating the students listening. And then the classroom acoustic assessment is really a fun thing for an audiologist to do. So what we do is uh, we go into a classroom after school when it's quiet um, and there's nobody in there. And we take some really specific technical measurements to look at the ambient noise level when the HVAC system is off and when it's on and to look at the reverberation time in the classroom. So these aren't just random numbers that we're looking at here. There are published standards um, from the Acoustical Society of America for classrooms. So all schools that are built have to adhere to these ASA standards. And the two main qualities of the standard are that ambient noise levels have to be 35 decibels or less, and that the reverberation time has to be 0 0.6 seconds in an unoccupied classroom. So we go in with a sound level meter, we measure for a, a lengthy period of time, the ambient noise level, both in quiet and with the HVAC system on. And then we measure the reverberation time in the classroom in several different places uh, by actually popping a balloon <laughs> and measuring the impulse noise of that balloon pop. And so what can come of an assessment like this is, uh, let's say the ambient noise is fine, but there's a huge echo. There's a lot of reverberation in the classroom. Uh, we can recommend that acoustic tiles be installed on the ceiling or the walls, that um, we put carpeting or area rugs in the classroom. And, you know, if the HVAC system is so noisy that it's not meeting the standard, that's impacting all of the students. And um, sometimes that just is a simple repair that can be done to make it a whole lot easier to hear. So I want to show you an example. Can you still see, can you see the report that just came up? Okay, good. So this is the acoustical assessment we did on Jacob in Jacob's classroom. So uh, I believe you, you have a copy of this that you can see that Audrey sent out in an email. Um, and so uh, it says, you know, the campus is located on a quiet street, though the construction on the school site is being completed and the room is adjacent to the construction site and the windows are facing out to the playground. And then I described the size of the room, the height of the ceilings, um, the number of students and adults in the room, the materials, the walls and floor were made out of uh, the locations of the windows, whether the doors are typically open or closed, um, information about the HVAC system and uh, sources of noise. So I, I took a couple I, uh, examples of a couple different noise sources that we heard in the classroom when occupied and unoccupied. Um, and so here I just describe um, in very great detail <laughs> where I took measurements and um, what we looked at for the reverberation time and I'm wondering what my results were. I wanna see them. Oh yeah, here they are. So the reverberation time actually looked pretty good in this classroom, which was nice. It was less than 0.6 seconds. And the 
ambient noise was the highest it got was up to 44.5. That was in the morning when they had the heat on and the door was open and I took a minute sample. So it did, yeah, when the heat was on and there was construction, um, it, it, was, it was loud, <laughs> it was loud in there. But there was nothing we could do about the construction. That was the problem because the construction had to happen. So we had to look at some ways to help mitigate that difficulty. Okay, how do I get back to my, there we go. So the functional listening evaluation is that other tool um, that I mentioned. This is a test that estimates a student's access to verbal instruction in the classroom and the importance of visual access, being able to see the teacher, distance from the instructor and noise in the classroom. So when I go to do a functional listening evaluation, it takes a bit of planning because what I need are an unoccupied classroom, the student, and um, those two things are, are often hard to come by <laughs> during the school day. So it takes a lot of, um, you know, uh, kindly requesting things of teachers and staff. Please, can I borrow this student in instead of them going to your class? Can they come and hang out with me when the class is in PE? Can I borrow this classroom? Somehow it always works out. So I bring a tape measure, I bring my speaker, I bring some uh, sound files, and we head on into the classroom with the student. So typically, uh, we test at two different distances. The first one here, you can see the students sitting there and then I'll test at three feet and then I'll test at 12 feet and I'll have the student repeat some sentences or words back to me. And the materials we use, there are some published word lists available that are these sentences. So big dogs can be dangerous. Um, if the student says big cats can be dangerous, they'll get four points instead of five points. If they miss all the words, they won't get any points for that. And the total is out of 50. If the student is unable to repeat back sentences or words, we can use pictures. So these are a closed set picture pointing task. So you can tell all these words kind of rhyme. So if I say uh, smoke, you'd point here. Or if you heard goat, you'd click there. If you heard coat, you, you, you'd point there. And we test in a few different conditions. So I already talked about up close and far away, but we also test in quiet and in noise with visual access and without visual access. So in order to take away the visual access, sometimes I'll have the student close their eyes, but more often, if I remember to bring it, I use this acoustic filter. So it's just speaker wire on an embroidery hoop. Um, so it doesn't block the sound of my voice. It just makes it so you can't see my mouth moving. Um, our students are listening without looking a lot more than we realize. If they're taking notes, if they are watching a video, having to write something down, if they're writing in their book while the instructor's talking, um, it's really important for us to know the impact on visual access for their understanding. Um, and so the easiest condition you can imagine is when the classroom's quiet, I'm three feet away from the student and they can see me. And the hardest condition is when I'm 12 feet away, there's noise in the classroom uh, and they cannot see my mouth. A student with typical hearing or auditory processing ability is expected to score 90% or better, even in the hardest condition. So that's the benchmark we use to determine if a student has appropriate access. So here are some examples of scores on a functional listening evaluation that I did with a student. Um, so up close, the student scored 92% when it was quiet, when they could see me. So, you know, they met that 92%. This red line here is at 90%. So you can see the only condition that this student had appropriate access was when I was three feet away from them in quiet when they were watching me speak. How often does that happen in a typical classroom? Not very often, nor would we want it to. We don't want a teacher sitting three feet in front of our student all day long while the student is staring directly at them. So 
um, in this situation, we had to put in some supports uh, to help the student hear better in the more challenging listening environments. Um, things like a Roger system where the teacher wears a microphone that goes into a, a small earpiece that the student wears in their ears or a speaker system in the classroom to amplify the students, the teacher's voice for all of the students. But we'll get more into that stuff later. Here is a real report from Jacob's classroom. Um, and so we started the test in the easiest condition um, and he got 84%, 86% when there was a little bit of noise. So he was really struggling there. Um, but what we learned is without visual access, there was no ability to comprehend. So before we did this, we had no idea how much visual input was crucial to this student's understanding. So this is a really powerful test because it illustrates very clearly um, the things that are hidden when we're not measuring them. We also did that auditory performance scale, the CHAPS, um, and it looks at different listening conditions. So in noise, how is the student in quiet in an ideal situation? And this is asking the teacher to compare um, a student's listening to their peers. Okay. Can I just comment on that, the previous, yes. on the CHAPS? Mm -hmm. what, I, what stuck out to me when I looked at that report was that he was at risk for everything except for the ideal condition. So yes. the only, if you go to the chaps again, the only um, normal was ideal listening mm -hmm. condition. Uh, and that's what really struck me was that this was a student who could not um, access auditory information and make sense of it without that ideal listening environment. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say that to a school team even if the evaluation says it, they might not know how to interpret an mm -hmm. auditory report or you know a, a detailed audiological assessment, but this was so clear. It was like, unless he's in this ideal set situation, which for him was close, visual, et cetera, then he couldn't, he couldn't uh, access that information appropriately. Yes, that's a really good point to emphasize. And remember, this was a classroom adjacent to the playground, adjacent to a construction zone. So that ideal environment was almost never there for the student. Um, so this gave us a lot of insight into, into what was going on. Um, I can get a little bit into the what I recommended here. Um, so we... Daphne, maybe you want to talk about this too. Um, this teacher came up with a kind of interesting solution. They had this semi-large closet in the classroom um, that they hung up like uh, cloth things on the walls and they made it this like nice acoustic environment. And Jacob would like sit in there with a desk with a teacher and he had his own little acoustic cave that for some of his core academic work, he worked with his teacher one-on-one -on -one in there and it was really helpful. Do you, do you remember that? Do you have any comments about that? I do. I think it was initially like a, like a reading nook or, you know, maybe just kind of like a quiet calm down zone. But um, I believe when you did the test in there, it, it did prove to be quieter than other areas of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think something, you know, it was just like a little sensory deprivation cocoon for him in some ways that, um, you know, he, he went in there and he was able to, you know, make marked improvement academically from, from that point on. And of course, you know, the next year moving him to a new classroom that was no longer in the midst of construction was helpful, but as Audrey pointed out, there's still not that ideal um, environment in often in a classroom. So even taking away the fact that he was, you know, no longer in the construction zone and no longer right on the playground, um, there, there's still a lot of inputs, auditory inputs that are very dis disturbing and distracting to him. Um, I actually have a question for, for sure. you, Amanda. Would you, um, 
In your experience, are these assessments static or would they change over time? Is this something that I could, you know, now Jacob's in middle school, he's with an all new team. Is this something I should be pointing them to and saying, hey, I know you're all new working with Jacob. This is what your, your own audiologist has found mm -hmm. <laughs> working for the district, um, even though it may be four years old. Um, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, in the schools, we do a triennial every three years, so it could be useful to, to redo this. Um, also, to redo it because he's so many more years past his surgery. And we wanna see in terms of neuromaturation and recovery, how he's doing. So I think it would be perfectly reasonable to repeat some of this um, if he's still struggling with that multiple auditory input issue. And can I add something here as well? Um, mm -hmm. So Dr. Tammy Regner, who co-authored our um, auditory, cortical auditory guide, um, We've spoken about this, about reassessment and um, neuromaturation. So, so one thing, um, there's no data that we've seen yet that shows that um, this improves over time. Um, this, the, when the child is diagnosed with a cortical auditory impairment, it can vary by individual, but we, it's not going, it, neuromaturation in a typically developing brain, there might be an improvement, but you're talking about a child that has the um, auditory cortex removed, right? Damaged or removed or disconnected. Um, and so, and neuromaturation is going to be different in our kids. Her recommendation was that our, any child with an auditory processing disorder or any auditory impairment at all should be reassessed every two years. So you can, you don't need to wait until the triennial, especially if there are new behaviors or they can't pay attention in class or they're not retaining information. You can request that evaluation every two years and the district is required to uh, provide this evaluation. And then um, neuromaturation might not be the same age for our kids as it would be for a typical kid. So I think typically, and Amanda, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like age 12 to 14 is auditory neuromaturation. Is that correct? I think there are some skills that we've measured that change up until we're 18 to 21. Yeah. I think it's yeah. different between boys and girls too. Yeah. Um, so she but, was saying through, through the IEP, you know, through age 22, basically, yeah. this is something you want to be reassessing Definitely. at least every three years with a new evaluation. And I think the question about the acoustical evaluation, if he's in a different setting, the functional listening evaluation would need to be repeated in that new setting. Is that correct? Right. Um, and middle school is very different than elementary school. The classrooms are different. They have different materials. They're usually larger. So um, I, I would recommend repeating it um, if there are listening concerns. If there is no concern, he's doing great, then no. But if, if it's an issue, then yeah, we want to figure out what's going on and how we can fix it. Um, I just had, so um, I am not working with the school district that I used to work with anymore. I'm working with a different school district now. So I just had a similar conversation with my current district about reassessing a student. They'd asked me to do some auditory training with a student, but the report um, that they had, this wasn't a, a, a student who had epilepsy. It's a student who just has normal auditory processing disorder, for lack of a better term. Um, the report was two years old, and I told them too much can happen in two years. It wouldn't be fair for me to start, you know, working on therapy based on this data because our brain changes a lot in two years. So yeah, I'd say two to three years is definitely a good uh, time to retest. Um, All right, so, oh, sorry, go just going back to your, can you go back to the, right, your recommendations? There were several questions yeah. about this in, um, that came to me through the registration. So I just want to make sure we touch on this. Sure. So, and so we're going to get into, into oh, more of that. More? Soon okay. Too. Then just move on. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but if I don't answer this question, let me know and we'll come back to it. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. So let's talk about improving classroom listening challenges. The first step is to improve the environment as needed. So if the reverberation time is really high, if it's too noisy in the classroom, we have all these physical tools we can use to help improve those things. Acoustic panels, um, there's this company called Felt Right, like they make things out of felt. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a pun. Um, they make really, really effective and also um, decorative acoustic panels you can put on walls in classrooms. You can put dampeners on chair feet. Don't use tennis balls, get real chair dampeners. Um, I, this is one of those things where like, when you know better, you do better. We always used to use tennis balls until we realized that we shouldn't use tennis balls and now we buy chair dampeners. Um, repairing or replacing old or noisy HVAC systems, um, which is a big deal, but it helps all the students in a classroom, really. If the air conditioning is so loud, everyone is going to be struggling. Um, and sometimes installing a classroom listening system. So I can't see it because all of our faces are covering there we go, are covering uh, the words here. So the CAD stands for Classroom Auditory Distribution System. Uh, it's a fancy term for a speaker and a microphone. The teacher wears the microphone and the speaker amplifies the teacher's voice to account for the noise level in the classroom. There are lots of different companies that make these types of systems. I really like this one called a Roger because it's the smartest one of all of them. The microphone not only listens to the teacher's voice, but it listens to the ambient noise in the classroom when the teacher is not speaking. So it knows how to automatically adjust the teacher's voice to separate their voice above the ambient noise. It's called the signal to noise ratio, and it always provides an optimal signal to noise ratio and it can't over amplify. So, you know, if a student was doing something dangerous and a teacher yelled, stop, it's not going to over amplify the teacher's voice and hurt the student's ears. It's a really smart system. Um, there are lots of great ones. This just happens to be my favorite. So I put it on the slide. I know this is a lot of text on this slide, but I kind of thought this could be something you could, you know, print out and put in your uh, <laughs> your memory bank if, if your student is struggling. Um, so these are some specific ways to improve classroom listening. So first of all, hearing assistive technology like uh, the CAD system I just described, a sound field system, amplifies the teacher's voice, sig enhances the signal to noise ratio for all of the students. So every Everyone can benefit from it. It doesn't single out an individual student, which for some students really can be important. There's also personal uh, microphone systems that are worn on the student's ears, earpieces they'll wear, and the teacher's microphone sends the sound directly to the student's ears. So we Mm, we remove the distance factor. It's like the teacher standing right in front of the student all the time when they're speaking. Um, and we mitigate the background noise factor by enhancing the signal to noise ratio. And we reduce the reverberation because we're getting a clear signal without reverberation directly into their ears. So a sound field system is great, um, but sometimes it's not enough. A student needs that audio right in their ears. This involves some training on part of the teacher. The teacher has to know how to use it, how to check if it's working. Uh, the student may not always be able to report if it's working. Um, and the teacher needs to know to mute it if they're having a private conversation with a student or they go to the bathroom or the teacher's lounge. Um, so it's a little more involved, but um, oftentimes really helpful. And then there are classroom accommodations. A huge one is open-ended checks for understanding. Uh, rather than the teacher asking, did you hear that? Or did you understand? Saying, what page did I just tell you to turn to? Or um, what country are we talking about? Or you know, something to get specific information about what the student heard. Asking the student to repeat back exactly what they heard. Because sometimes they heard something completely different than what the teacher said. But if you ask, did you hear me? They'll say yes, because they did. Um, small group instruction can often be really helpful. A separate quieter setting like we saw in Jacob's classroom with his nook that the teacher created. Um, putting up acoustic buffers in the classroom, uh, even around desks. Uh, and sometimes that can be good for visual distraction too. Like if the student's taking a test, you can put up a buffer around their desk. Flexible classroom seating is key. 
preferential seating is um, a nice thing to have, but we want it to be flexible because if the teacher likes to lecture or teach from different parts of the room, we want the student to be able to get up and move to where they can hear best. Um, also, if there are multi-step directions, if a student struggles with, with that, um, presenting them sequentially one at a time instead of all at once can help the student be more successful in following those directions and uh, allowing for listening breaks. So if this is a situation where the kiddo is just getting overwhelmed by sound, letting them put on some earmuffs or noise canceling headphones and, and just you know sit in a quiet spot and chill out for a couple minutes until they're ready to engage again. And this was another, um, another one that was big with um, our buddy Jacob, extra care for physical safety in unfamiliar and dynamic environments. Is it okay if I talk about this, Daphne? Okay, so Jacob had some visual challenges in addition to auditory, and um, it, it was becoming a bit of a safety issue because he wouldn't see something that was coming towards him, especially out on the playground or walking from place to place around the classroom. So we, we had a, a system that he would wear um, with headphones, and then the teacher had a microphone, and if he was going to... Um, it, be in any kind of situation where he was going to run into something or something was going to run into him, the teacher could tell him through the microphone and the ear, the sound would go directly to his ears. So even if he couldn't see the teacher standing on that side of him or the obstacle standing on the side of him, he could hear it in both of his ears, the warning. So that was kind of a creative uh, thing that we improvised. <laughs> to, and and that's, the, that's the fun part about... Um, Identifying these challenges is coming up with creative ways to implement them because as we know, every student is different and unique and needs different things. Um, there are also compensatory strategies for improving listening challenges. So developing self-advocacy skills, learning to identify challenging situations and how to remedy them, encouraging the child to um, to be their own advocate. And this is a lifelong skill. It's really hard to learn, you know, for kids, for adults, it's hard to advocate for ourselves. So it's an, an ongoing thing we can be working on. Um, teaching the child to repeat back what they heard for clarification, learning to ask for a listening break when needed, using visual tools, schedules, organizers to, in, uh, to supplement the auditory information, and also metacognitive strategies to improve executive functioning can often be helpful in improving um, self-advocacy skills. And then there's auditory training. There's formal auditory training programs, and there's at-home things that you can work on too. Um, Audrey and I were emailing a little bit, there is not a lot of research on auditory training for um, children or adults, anyone who's had a hemispherectomy or corpus callosum surgery. Um, so there's a lot of research on auditory training for people with normal auditory processing disorder, but this is an area that needs some improvement in the research. All right, so pop quiz time. I'm pulling up our four questions again. So the first question is classroom acoustics. How can a quiet classroom actually be too noisy? What are some sneaky sources of noise in a classroom? Oh, I just realized people have been putting things in the chat this whole time and I haven't seen any of them. And I'm so sorry, because I couldn't see it because I had my screen share going. We'll circle back to questions after this quiz part. And I'm, okay. I have others that were emailed to me ahead of time as well. Okay, cool. Can anybody um, put in the chat or say out loud um, something that can make a classroom too noisy? Reverberation, very good. Anything else? AC system, awesome. I'm gonna add in the classroom next door. If your student's classroom is still teaching when recess is happening for other kids out on the playground, playground noise, very good. Okay, awesome. All right, listening challenges. What listening challenges can occur due to poor classroom acoustics?
So um, what if a student has no trouble when the teacher's like right in front of them, but um, can't seem to function uh, during small group work when uh, all the groups are talking at the same time? Background noise, reverberation, all of those things um, can contribute to difficulty. And I don't want to answer because I know some of this, but I would say, <laughs> um, so there's those phonemic and phonological challenges. There's not understanding what was, what, what the teacher was saying, what the topic mm -hmm. is. Um, and then also attention and behavior is often really impacted in kids with um, CAPD that's missed because it's written off as a behavior issue or ADHD and they're not look, addressing the underlying problem of this mm -hmm. acoustic issue. And um, when, when it's corrected, it's amazing what a difference it can make for the student. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, assessment. How can we measure a student's auditory access in the classroom? What are some tools that we have in our toolbox to do this assessment? Who can remember the name of some of the tests? The Life R, very good. Anybody remember my favorite one? I'll put it in the chat. The functional listening evaluation. That's my favorite one because it shows us those hidden difficulties um, with the visual versus non-visual, quiet versus noise, and close versus far. And management. How can we help students hear and understand better in the classroom? What are some of the tools and strategies that we discussed? Who can remember one? Sound systems, awesome, Melinda. Lisa, speaker and microphone, excellent. What about tennis balls on chair legs? Big Stacy, I like that. <laughs> when we Very think good. about to what happened with um, with Jacob in the classroom and the fact that they took this closet and turned it into a quiet space for him, um, one thing I think that was really important about that was that it had floor to ceiling walls and a door. It mm -hmm. was not just a um, carol, a study carol. Um, it was actually a quiet room. And um, there was another family I was helping whose daughter had a temporal lobectomy and she was getting all of her literacy one-on-one -on -one resource time pull out in a resource room. So there were um, four groups happening at the same time with, a, with partial wall dividers. And she was really, really struggling. And I said, can you just try uh, working with her in really a truly quiet setting and they did and and it made a significant difference they got um they found that the school psychologist was not in her office at the same time as her literacy instruction so that's where the teacher provided the instruction that made a significant difference yeah that's a hugely common thing that happens resource rooms are noisy busy places um so that's a really important thing to ask your um students IEP team about. Okay, so uh, that's it for, for me. I just wanna you know, say thank you to Audrey for inviting me to, to be here today and Daphne for sharing your family's story and for all of you, thank you for being here. Um, I was so excited to come chat with everybody and get to know you all. And um, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. This was so helpful. I hope everyone else um, is excited about this as I am because you explained it in such a simple, easy to digest way, I think. Um, I have a, there's a couple questions that came up in the chat and beforehand, and then I also have a question. One question that came when you were speaking earlier was, um, uh, sorry, if, is it an, if it's an old building, so we're talking about acoustics now, classroom acoustics, can that be way out of meeting the standards? So, my question, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, is can they say, well, the building's old, so we don't need to meet the standards? Or do the ASHA standards or the whoever it is that's setting those acoustic measures for appropriate classroom acoustics, are they allowed to bow, you know, say, well, we can't fix it because of it's an old building kind of thing? Um, what a good question. 
they can say it's an old building. That's why it doesn't meet the standards. You can't build a new building that doesn't meet the standards. And honestly, there are a lot of new buildings that don't meet the standards. So, so you that's be why we better. test. <laughs> that's why we do the testing. Um, if, a, if a room is not meeting the standards, then in order to provide free and appropriate access to education, they have to modify the room to meet the standards. Okay, great. Um, I have a question on the accommodations. Um, I've often heard audi audiologists say that, especially for our kids who've had brain surgery for epilepsy, so they have epilepsy, which is an underlying condition, then they have usually the kids that end up having brain surgery, there might be some other underlying conditions. And then, you know, auditory processing is part of the picture, but it's, it's complicated. So I've often heard that you should repeat instructions and not rephrase them because rephrasing them means the brain needs to process new information. What do you think about that? I think that for many people, that's a really helpful solution. Okay. Not for everyone. There's no one size fits all here. Mm -hmm. um, if, if a student typically, you know, mishears things, has like phonemic confusion, um, repetition can be really helpful or mm -hmm. asking the child what they heard, having the child repeat it so you can tell what they heard. Mm -hmm. um, Rephrasing can also be very useful. What if it's, you know, a word that the student didn't know? There's a lot of reasons why we can mishear something. Mm -hmm. So rephrasing can also be helpful, but I would, um, I would, you know, and a lot of teachers do this anyway. They repeat, they repeat it twice or three times. And then if a student still doesn't get it, they'll rephrase. So I think using a combination of them can be helpful, but this is going, you know, back to, auditory processing testing, which we haven't talked about today. Um, there are specifics that you can find in testing that can help you determine if repetition or rephrasing will be more helpful to a particular person. So that should be teased out in assessment then. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so here's a question in that, um, well, there's a couple others that came up first. Let me go back here. So okay. someone had asked about what does a good school-based audiology assessment look like? I know we're not, we don't really have time to dive into that today, um, but I, I want to just let, let uh, families that are listening to this know that in our power hours and in other webinars, this is something that we definitely are addressing, um, and we can do another um, session just on what is a good CAPD assessment for our kids. Um, a question that just popped in the chat, and you can answer that if you want, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I want to make sure we get through everything. Mm -hmm. What can families do where school districts don't have an audiologist to come into the school? We've done CAPD testing in another state, but there isn't anyone in our area who is an educational audiologist. How do we get our district to do any of this? It's really tough because there are a lot of districts that don't have their own audiologist. Um, Sometimes families will have to go out on their own and get their own audiologist to do this. Sometimes they can demonstrate the need to the IEP team. So the IEP team can do or can can um, do an independent educational evaluation. So they will contract with the audiologist to do the assessment. Um, I mean, there's two ways. You can do an IEE where the family chooses their own provider or the, the district can decide to find a provider and have the provider do the service mm -hmm. on a contract basis instead of being their employee. Um, yeah, yeah I, do, I do that type of work for um, school districts, FYI, but only in California. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, in Power Hour, I'm sure a lot of you have heard me say, we don't do that here. It's not an excuse to not provide a service. So if it's exactly. not a service... Yeah. And it's it's documented that this is an area of need, um, then they have to provide the service. So if they have to fly someone in from out of state because there's no one in their state, that's what they would need to do. Um, Lillian, I see your hand raised. Do you want to comment on this or do you have a different question? Um, yeah, a, kind of uh, along the same lines. I actually don't, don't know if there is an actual um, specialty, like an educational audiology specialty or yeah. can any any audiologist sort of do the evaluation potentially if they can come to the school and all of that? So there's no, there currently isn't a designated specialty for educational audiology. I think that is going to change. Um, any audiologist can can become, can say they're an educational audiologist. So you want to, you want to get some understanding of the audiologist's 
experience and what assessment tools they'll be using. Um, I, I, I wasn't an educational audiologist until I was. <laughs> and so um, a lot of audiologists stumble into educational audiology because they're the only one around and there's a need for it. So I would just, you know, look at the person's work experience qualifications and chat with them about um, their educational audiology background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there is actually um, an Educational Audiology Association, EAA. Um, I believe on their website, you can look up members of EAA um, by location. So that's a good way to find one too. One thing about central auditory processing uh, disorder. It's also known as cortical auditory dis uh, processing disorder. It's also known as auditory processing disorder. So you might hear um, Dr. Regner, um, who our co-author on the paper, calls it CAP. I've heard. So I'm not exactly sure the distinction, and that was a question that came up. But my understanding is it's all referring to the same set of dysfunctions, basically. Um, but I've, I've helped families when they wanted to find an audiologist in the district have said, oh, yeah, our district audiologist will do the assessment. And the parent gets on the phone with the district audiologist and says, so um, my child had a temporal lobectomy or a TPO or a hemispherectomy or something along those lines. Um, so do you understand what happens when that, you know, the auditory cortex is removed? And they have no idea what the parent's talking about. So they don't know that the auditory cortex is located in the temporal lobe. They don't understand the impacts of removing or disconnecting the temporal lobe and how it impacts. Some of them don't even no auditory processing. I don't know how common that is. Amanda, maybe you can speak to that, but an audiologist may not know about central auditory processing disorder. Some, some do, some don't. So it would be a matter of getting an audiologist who is skilled and well-versed in central auditory processing disorder and ideally is knowledgeable about your child's condition because you yes. need to have an expert on the team who under, an evaluator who's not qualified to evaluate your child shouldn't evaluate. So if it's someone who has no idea, you know, and I, I want to say, Amanda, I think you didn't, you're not an expert in hemispherectomy. You have learned, but you sought out research and you dove in and you figured it out, right? So it's right. not like everyone has to have that past experience, but has to be willing to look at the research and figure out what the answer is, right? Exactly. And there are some audiologists who have no interest in auditory processing, unfortunately. That is not the audiologist you want to work with. Um, if an audiologist has interest and experience working with auditory processing, but never has met someone with a hemispherectomy, like I was, um, and they're willing to work with you and learn, then that's, that's a great start. Most audiologists should know that the auditory cortex is in the temporal lobe. And if you sever the corpus callosum, you're gonna have major impact. But beyond that, um, unless they've had specific education and training in auditory processing, a lot of audiologists aren't um, knowledgeable in this area. Um, there is an, a place you can find audiologists who specialize in auditory processing. I'm putting it in the chat. It's called IGAPS, the International Guild of Auditory Processing Specialists. And um, they have a map of audiologists all over the world who uh, do this work. Great, excellent. Um, I have a question for you. And then there's a question in the chat and there's a few more. And I've said in the chat, if people need to jump off, please do. We're gonna run a few minutes over and you can catch this on the recording if you can't stick with us for a few more minutes. So I have a question about the functional listening evaluation, which since you were the first one that introduced me to it and very few schools do this. And when I often when I ask for it, they don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, my question for you is, can a student have a functional listening evaluation without having a CAPD diagnosis? Absolutely. Okay, so that's and really this is important a, yeah, yeah. For parents to understand. This is a common test that we also use with students who are deaf or hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, a, it's an effective test to demonstrate listening ability with any student. Um, you know, it was normed on students with typical hearing. That 90% benchmark comes from mm -hmm. students who don't have CAPD and they don't have a hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So for any reason, if a student um, is struggling listening in the classroom, it's a good test for it. Mm -hmm. Um, a question, a couple questions came up um, in advance um, of this meeting uh, in the registration is about how it's, there is some, um, some controversy. There, there's some people out there that say that 
APD or CAPD don't, it's not a valid diagnosis. And some schools will hang on to that as a reason not to evaluate, not to treat. And, you know, my, my response to that is often what they're talking that maybe in a child that didn't have their cortical um, auditory cortex, you know, their auditory cortex removed, that might be an argument that could hold water. But can you just speak to that briefly? Like, how do you respond when, if you hear that from a school team or, you know, how would you respond to that? Um, I would say that there's legal precedent to disprove that. <laughs> there, there are cases where families have um, taken their school districts to court that are documented in the literature mm -hmm. where the school district has failed to provide support for a legitimate disability. Mm -hmm. So um, they can consult their educational attorney. Yeah. Um, whether you've had, whether you have central auditory processing difficulty because of epilepsy surgery or your brain just works differently than someone would typically expect, yeah. um, there is enough evidence-based research on the effects of auditory processing difficulty and the efficacy of treating it. Mm -hmm. Now that when someone says that they are usually looking for an easy way out and it's, it's not factual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Um, I had one fam, one parent reach out to me and said that her child had had a hemispherectomy and does have a diagnosed auditory processing disorder actually had a normal functional listening evaluation. So the child did end up still receiving audiological services and, and interventions because of the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But have you ever seen that where there's a child that has a known deficit, but their but their, their functional listening evaluation is normal. Rarely, but yes, Rarely. it does happen yeah. because it might not be um, a hearing and noise issue for them. Mm -hmm. Might not mm -hmm. be that they need visual input. They might have difficulty with um, the timing aspects of speech. They might have difficulty with uh, tonal processing. Mm -hmm. So there are so many different ways that our yeah. brain processes speech. And um, if you're lucky enough to be able to hear speech and noise clearly, that's wonderful. Yeah. But the test will tell you. The information one way or another. Mm -hmm. There's a question about reading. Um, does CAPD directly impact the ability to read just beyond just the physical ability to hear? For example, phonemic awareness requires not just the ability to hear a word, but the ability to break down that word into its composite sounds. Is that impacted by CAPD or is that considered more of a language related disability or is it all interconnected? So great question. I that's it is that is a great question. I can't say with 100% certainty. I don't think anyone can that CAPD causes reading difficulty. But what I can say is that the parts of our brain that process sound on a phonemic level um, have a lot to do with the parts of our brain that process visual input on a phonemic level. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes someone who has uh, auditory processing disorder often has dyslexia as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a correlation between the two and it just all has to do with how our brain is processing sensory input. Okay, a um, couple more. So what about a degree of CAPD? Like what is a mild versus a severe case look like? This, the, the, mm. saying, I know what my kid's case like, it feels my, mild, but I wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. That's an interesting question. Um, there's no standardized classification of mild or severe. I would just look at an individual's findings and say, um, well, okay, let me give you an example. There are, depending on what model of APD diagnosis you're using, there are five or six different diagnosable auditory deficits. And somebody might have difficulty with one and be totally fine with all the other ones. Somebody might have difficulty with three or four of them. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how many areas you're struggling in mm -hmm. with how, I guess, severe you could consider it to be. Yeah. But there's like, we categorize hearing loss as normal, mild, moderate, severe, profound, but mm -hmm. we don't have a similar way to categorize APD. One thing I will say is in the research that was done by Dr. Musiak and Monica's still on, maybe she can speak to this. Um, I believe it was in adults after, um, I'm not exactly sure, Monica, maybe you could speak to that study, but what, what, they, what he found is that in, an, in a dichotic environment, a multiple sound environment, 100% of them, even with normal pure tone audiograms, the ear opposite surgery 
was function was extinct, like it was extinguished in a multiple sound environment. So I consider yeah. that a severe impairment in a dichotic environment like a classroom. Monica, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, that, that was our, our former scientific advisor, as uh, chief scientific officer, Stella DeBode, that has mm -hmm. published quite a bit on hemispherectomy in general. So this is hemispherectomy research, mm -hmm. but the ear opposite the removed hemisphere basically does not hear when there are multiple speakers in the room. It is extinguished. So one thought Dr. Musiak had, and this is in one of our research meetings, he said, what if you just put an earplug into that ear to get all sound out from coming into it so that the only ear that processes sound is the ear on the same, the, that's going into a, the remaining hemisphere. If, so yeah. if you have a left hemispherectomy, you put an earplug in the right ear so that sound is only coming into the left ear and you're not getting the jumbling, the, the, the I don't know what the proper phrase would be, but you're not the getting distortion. the noise, so to speak, the distortion. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the research shows that it's quote unquote, totally extinguished in a dichotic environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And that's something that we'll often do with, um, Sometimes people will have uh, who who have hearing loss will have one ear. Maybe they've had a tumor on the auditory nerve. Maybe they've had a, a a virus that attacks the nerve that destroys the fidelity of sound on that side. So you can test their hearing, but there's no useful information coming in through one ear. Mm -hmm. We'll sometimes do that, or we'll put a hearing aid only on their better ear because mm -hmm. the distortion can distract from their comprehension. And I've also done functional listening evaluations on students in that situation, listening with one ear versus listening with two. And sometimes you can actually see degraded performance when they're listening to two ears compared to one. Mm -hmm. We do a school training that um, uh, Monica created and I've been uh, presenting to a lot of schools. Um, Daphne, like your school team now in middle school, you could invite, you know, said like the team to receive training and, and we, we cover everything in the training and there's a big section on auditory uh, processing issues after, you know, whatever surgery and it's tailored to the surgery your child has had and where we go over kind of the, all of these implications um, and, and sort of what can be done. Um, so there is a question here about um, what do you do from a services or intervention perspective? Her, my child's services are mostly consult time with accommodations and an outside audiologist um, declined to evaluate or work with her because they felt her IEP already covered everything they'd recommended anyway. Is that normal or is there more that could be done? And I know you touched on a little bit how there's not a lot of research on what, what would be the right intervention after hemispherectomy or, or temporal lobectomy or corpus callosotomy. Um, any, any thought about services and interventions in the school setting other than changing the acoustical environment and putting accommodations in place? You, you can't know unless you test. That's my perspective is um, you, you don't know what you don't know. So I have looked at IEPs for kids with APD and said, oh, they're already doing all these fabulous things that would help someone who had APD. But by doing the testing and figuring out exactly what the child's deficits are, you can fine tune those recommendations to be more effective and more specific, or you may discover something you weren't even aware of before. So I think, you know, that that's a good, you know, tier one, tier two approaches. Let's just mm -hmm. put these supports in there to help this child. But if, if the child is still struggling and they haven't done the assessment, I would, I would ask them, yeah, can we please do this? We need to know what we're missing. I haven't heard, just to respond to that question a little bit too, I haven't heard of school teams offering any kind of auditory training or auditory intervention, um, like vision therapy, which sometimes is offered for a vision impairment, depending on the school district. Um, but it's I've never heard of that happening with auditory therapy that the school district has provided, um, but there's always exceptions to the rule. And again, it depends on what the assessment says. There's one last question I have, um, which I thought was quite interesting. This was a, um, about a man who's now 24 at a hemispherectomy at age eight, left hemispherectomy. Um, he's got a, a bachelor's degree and he's doing a job in accounting in a very loud environment. 
and has requested a quiet place to work, but his HR has instead provided him with active noise canceling headphones. Um, the parent is saying to me that this actually makes things worse for her son. So is there any medical basis that says that this should or should not work? And also they picked an off the shelf, like here are some noise canceling headphones, this will help. And he's saying it's making it worse, but can you speak to a lot of uh, people in our community that a lot of kids use noise canceling headphones because they have also have hyperacusis or other um, sound sensitivity, but can you speak a little to the use of noise canceling headphones and what would be appropriate? I think it's, it's another one of those person specific things that we can't really generalize. Some people love active noise canceling headphones. They've got their Bose headphones. It cuts everything out and it helps them focus and it's so helpful. Other people, it's very disorienting to them to have no sense of what's going on around them. So um, that's really tricky. I I would, you know, look look back at the reasonable accommodation wording mm -hmm. um, yeah. from the ADA, and if they've provided a reasonable accommodation, but it 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 doesn't work. Um, hopefully, they would be open to trying something different and letting the individual have some say in what that different thing is. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're at time. Um, someone said it's good to hear the noise canceling can be more disorienting. That's the case with my son. Um, yeah. And I, it's, it's, we could go on. I'm sure we could talk for another hour or two about all the strange stories we've heard about how kids don't always fit what you'd expect in the testing too. We've had um, same ear advantage when they should be opposite ear advantage um, after post hemispherectomy, surprisingly, and other unusual presentations. And each each kid, each person is really unique. Like you said, the testing is so essential. Um, do any of you that are left here have one last question, or should we let um, Dr. Levy go to her uh, dogs and family? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. This was so amazing. Um, I will be sharing resources with everyone um, via email. This will be posted on our website. And, um, you know, please reach out if you have any questions. And thank you again so much. We're so grateful for your time, both Daphne and Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. It was, you know, a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, nice to see everybody. Super Thanks for helpful. coming. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye.